All right, so I'm just waiting for the live people uh, to get on. This is an unannounced uh, broadcast, so if you're watching the um, post-live version of this, uh, give it about 30 seconds or so, and then the live show will get going. Uh, we'll see how many people get in. The notification is going to go out soon. Mm. I will not answer. Hmm. Yo, yo. Of course, the phone starts ringing. Um. <laughs> hey, hey, Nicola, how are you? I'm just going to wait for people to get on. Yeah, I wasn't going to broadcast today. I was kind of tired, but I figured last minute I'll do a short one. Uh, had some interesting experience over the last couple of days that I think will be useful for everybody to know. I'm going to wait for it, for us to get about 75, 100 people, and then I'm going to jump on. Uh, good to see you. Thanks so much for always answering my emails. I try. I don't get to too many people. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? I'm going to wait for about 75, 100 people to show up, and I'm going to jump into the subject. There's a couple things I want to cover today. Um, number one, learning to code. I got a question put to me a while back, and I'm just going to quickly cover this because it's a question I get often enough. And then what I want to do is go over um, modern web security. Uh, I had an interesting experience over the last few days that uh, I think will help you guys out a lot. All right. Hey, fellow Montreal. That's Grossman. Hello from Montreal. Thanks for your wise words. I'm glad I could help, fellow Montrealer. Hopefully this COVID thing will end pretty soon. Huh? Uh, can you do some content on using Beautiful Soup and Scrappy? I would have to look at them. I haven't used them. Getting stuck in Python OOP. Are you doing my course? Uh, let me know. I cover that in my Python course. Hello, Colleen. How are you doing? I decided last minute to do a quick one. I'm going to do a quick uh, broadcast. Half an hour, that's it. Half an hour. Only 36 people. I guess that's what happens when you don't uh, put out the notice in advance. Ah, from India. Hello, from India. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for logging in. What time is it now in India? It must be getting late, 11.30, midnight, something like that. What is a high-paying and low-stress job in computer science engineering? Uh, you don't want to, I'll tell you what the highest stress jobs are. Working for startups could be exciting, but high stress because tight deadlines. The lowest stress would probably be working for a medium-sized company that has an established product and they're just doing maintenance on the code. Maybe a little bit more boring, depending on how you feel like it. Uh, but, uh, you know. what? What's your go-to screencasting software? Well, right now I'm paying for this Ecamm Live, which you see. But I've tried OBS. I'm not sure. I might change up later on. We'll see how it goes. Hi, Stefan. Solution for this video title is what I need. Web security. Yeah, well, it's personal security. Not so much um, website security, although it could be argued that it is related. Okay. Yeah, o OOP can be hard to um, understand. Um, yeah, just keep writing the code. Go through that chapter. Finish the chapter, even if you don't understand things. Restart the chapter for, again, go through the videos, write the code. Very important that you write the code. And if that helps, then what you might want to do, if you know basic PHP, I have a free OOP tutorial I wrote in PHP, and there's videos, segments as well. It's 21 steps. People love that tutorial. I wrote it like 10,000 years ago, and I still keep it live, and it was very, very popular. And a lot of people have told me over the years that it really made uh, understanding OOP not just OOP, PHP, but OOP, easy. So you want to try that one out. Uh, 
Mm, that's interesting. I subscribed to the hosting service you mentioned in a previous video. I'm having problems with the administration and the file system of the service, but I got my rudimentary web page up. Hmm. Well, keep working at it. Um, um, I had no trouble with them myself, but, uh, you know, keep working at it. I'm sure it will get resolved. Why do you always look so sad? <laughs> it's this, my serious face. When I'm thinking about five or six different things that are going on at the same time, I'm doing a live stream, we're looking at questions, I got subjects to cover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that may be part of it. Also, I may be, um, I don't know if I'm a little stressed, probably, well, I'm about to move, so that's taking up a lot of my time. So, okay, we're at 70 people, and uh, I will get into a couple of subjects. I think one of them, well, I think the both of them will be um, interesting for it. How can I get started in competitive programming as, as a complete com beginner? I'm 16 and just started programming. I love your videos. Help me a lot. Love from Nepal. Oh, cool. Um, why do you want to do competitive programming? Just for fun? Um, if you wanted to advance your coding skills, if you know your fundamentals, just get out there and do real works, real work works, real work, and you're going to improve much more quickly. So let me just jump into this question. Now we, we got 70 people, enough people. I'm going to jump into this question that uh, somebody had, and here it is right here. And then we're just going to go, this, people know my stuff, know the answer, but I'm just going to cover this. So he, uh, he starts off, I understand this is like asking for a magic potion. I'm the magic potion man. But at times, typically after taking one to two day break away from coding, I go blank. It's very difficult to refresh. That's normal, especially when you're first learning, because when you're learning to code for the first time, you're literally restructuring the way your brain processes information. You're learning a totally different way of thinking, so that's normal. On the other hand, it feels like after five to six days, my little mind can't hack it anymore. It can be this difficult. Can it? It can't be this difficult for everyone. It is that difficult for most people. Again, when you're training your mind to learn code, when you're learning to code, you're training your mind, you're, you're almost, re, you're probably restructuring aspects of your brain. And just like if you're working out, um, there's going to be soreness as you're developing new muscle memory, you're building up new muscle. Um, so you need to give your brain a chance to, to uh, some downtime so it has time to repair itself and to uh, acclimate, I think it might be a good word, to the new knowledge, the new way of thinking. So that's why I always suggest to people you do a minimum 20 minutes a day and you take days off, drink lots of water, exercise. So if you're feeling stressed out, uh, take a day off and then the next day do 20 minutes and then if you're still feeling like stressed in the brain, then take a, then just do the 20 minute thing. And, but take days off every two days. Now, if you find yourself, you haven't coded for uh, two days uh, and you're going blank, again, just do that 20 minutes or maybe do 20 minutes a day minimum just to keep it going. Don't worry, iteration, meaning, you know, keep practicing, keep practicing. Uh, sooner than later, it's going to sink in and you're going to start understanding. It's a question of repetition and it's a question of actually writing real code. Write real code, write real code, okay? Any tips on how to find the proper pace so I don't have a huge lapses in knowledge? That's what you have to do. Um, that's why I designed my training app in uh, that particular way where the videos are short or six minutes max well, on average or six minutes uh, a few questions to reinforce the system remembers where you are and of course takes you right back so you can take times off that's it iteration 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 is the key to it all repetition repetition take breaks drink lots of water all this kind of stuff and uh, you will be good all right so I'll do a few more questions, and then I'll get back to the second subject. All right, let's see what we got. Is it worth using TypeScript for how long TypeScript will stay in the market? Mm, that's a good question. I think TypeScript is going to be one of those languages that is kind of niche -y. Um, I have a, a, a saying or expression, expression rather. I say, learn on a need-to-nerd basis, need-to-nerd basis. It's my play on the to know basis. So what I would suggest you do is you, you categorize TypeScript 
as one of those languages and technologies that you learn when you need to learn it on a need to nerd basis because it's it's more of a niche language it's specialized and you may run into it but far more likely you're going to run into javascript jobs or java jobs or c sharp jobs or python jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's what i would do with typescript it I don't know if it's going to be around in five years, probably, but it, it seems to be it's very, very niche so who knows. How to be procrastination, especially when you know how to code. I love your stream. Thank you. Hmm. Um, what I do, there are some days where I have, I call that Iggy-itis, procrastination. I call it Iggy-itis. It's named after a friend of mine, an ex-friend. His name was Iggy, world's laziest person. And... Um, and and but I I I I feel bad for him because I I I'm typically a guy who likes to work. It's just my habit. I developed it for years and years from years and years of martial arts and business and so on and coding. Um, but I remember I, I, for the first time in a long long time it was a few years back. I became so uh, lethargic and I became so lazy. I was procrastinating to do anything. I just didn't feel like doing anything. And it was like a chemical thing in my brain. So if you feel uh, procrastinations, what I would do is you do that 20 minutes of coding. And if you still, if it doesn't carry you on beyond 20 minutes, then go do some hard exercise, work out, drink lots of water, healthy food, work out. What you eat and drink, by the way, has a huge impact in terms of your cognitive capacity. They've done tests, like, uh, I don't know if you saw that um, documentary years ago called Supersize Me, where this guy ate McDonald's for 30 days and he got fat and depressed and lazy And uh, in that documentary. And what they did is they talked about a study where they, they were feeding students uh, who were delinquent students that had, meant, that had um, social problems and so forth. And what they did is they put them on a diet of really healthy food and all those social problems went away their intellectual became much uh, much more capable. So the food you eat could have a huge impact in terms of your ability to um, to learn to code, to write code, to be consistent. What you eat and exercise has a huge role. So keep that in mind. Now what's this? You remind me of my favorite actor, Nicolas Cage. All right. <laughs> I get that once in a while. Uh, hey, Stefan, love your content. I just got my first job offer, and I'm going to start this week. Congratulations. Fantastic. Good stuff. Any tips, tricks you could give since this is my first software job ever? Number one tip, understand what it is the company is doing. What's their product? Really get to know it, although you must know something. You got the job offer. Start boning up or becoming better at whatever stacks, technologies they happen to use. Learn to um, start developing your social skills, interpersonal skills, and learn to listen and uh, be on time. And of course, don't smell. Don't smell. Not to say you're a smelly person. That's just one of my jokes. All right. Good hygiene. You know, don't dress like a slob. I'm sure you dress well. For a beginner who hasn't yet started coding, would you suggest getting into the Java environment or JavaScript one? I would go... So that's a tough one. I would go JavaScript because Java can be a pain in the butt to set up on your computer. Um, in some ways, Java is more consistent uh, a language, although there's much more to learn about Java early on. I would go JavaScript because JavaScript, you can get some feedback. You can get some uh, stuff happening much more easily. Or, or Java can be a pain to just get up and running. But in many respects, the Java language is cleaner, but it is very verbose, meaning you got a lot write a lot of JavaScript code relative to other languages to get something happening. That's why, uh, yeah, there you go. Here we go. Let's see what Nicola has to say. Should I combine PHP and Python on the same back-end project, or should I stick to one back-end language? Generally, you want to avoid having too many technologies inside of a project, but there may be situations where, for instance, you have to, there's a very good Python library that will get the job done. So then you could have your, let's say you had a PHP front end, you could have the PHP front end uh, call the Python library or get the response from the Python li library. 
Um, so let the project determine that. But as a general rule, you want to simplify. The best developers write simple architectures and simple code. All right. What are your number one pet peeve with the industry and why? Hmm. My number one pet peeve is overcomplication, overcomplication, uh, or adding too much, too much complication needlessly to um, to the process. I've seen it in, in, in whether it be in web stacks, whether it be in uh, DevOps, whether it be in server configurations. They tend to the, the industry tends to see a new idea that's cool. And they take it to a, to an extreme level of complexity. This is my little chart going up, complex, complex. And then they realize, whoa, whoa, it's getting a little bit too complex, and they, they calm it down again. So I first noticed this with the um, uh, the Java world, and back in the '90s, Java became super, super complex, and it became so so complex and so difficult to use that there was a big revolt with the java community where they actually rejected the official standards because the official standards were just silly so uh, i think i see a bit of that today with devops uh, and expecting um, developers to be devops experts and having to learn all kinds of different tools and deployments i think it's um, uh, you got to calm that down a little, and I see I see actually movements in that direction. Um, also, with um, uh, even with plain old uh, this web development, the front end, it got uh, pretty complex. Uh, HTML5 was a response to that. They were people were doing XHTML. They had very rigid rules, and it got in the way of productive web development. So the HTML5 uh, guys. And, and girls, they put together a spec based on reality, and uh, when they released that, it quickly replaced the old XHTML methodology, which was overly uh, zealot, zealous with regards to um, code purity, if you will. So there you go. Would you recommend finding a job during uni studies? I've been doing Java for seven years. You've been studying Java for seven? Yeah, for sure. On the job experiences were huge huge on the job experience. So I would definitely do that. And you make money, make contacts at the same time. Thanks for your advice, Stefan. I think this is about learning OOP. I, I think I'm hitting the wall learning to code. I want to get the fundamentals right to jump back into Django. Well, if you're hitting the wall a little bit, maybe do some little mini projects for some clients. Could be a WordPress install. Could be uh, setting up a simple cart, uh, and uh, yeah, you know, just to give yourself a little break. You know, when you're hitting the wall on something, you get, this is a trick in programming. You may, you will come across a situation where you have a bug, and a lot of your coding time is bug bug tracking. Actually, most of it could be bug tracking, and you may hit a wall where you just don't get it, and after a certain period of time, you just got, you got to just say, okay, forget it. We're going to move, come back to this the next day. And often doing that is when you solve the problem. The next day you come back, you sit down, you oh, okay, now I see what the problem was. So yeah, change it up a little bit. Don't be afraid to change it up. You are what you eat, pretty much, pretty much. Mm. Finding a job during university or at least an internship will help a lot, for sure. I learned a lot more working for three months than one year of university. Pretty much, Zafar Ali, you are 100% on with that. You learn as you actually do the real work. Hi, mister. I want to learn security, but I don't even know what that is. I know what I don't know what security is either. I think it's security. Uh, yeah, it, there's all kinds of different levels of security. I'm just messing around with you. We all do typos when we write out things, so it's no big deal. Ah, uh, what's this? Coder 101. He asks, "What is your favorite thing about the industry? What inspired you to code?" I learned to code because I needed a uh, a website for my business. It had nothing to do with technology. It was an import export business, fish water purification, fish products, food, a very weird business. And uh, so I learned to code to get a website up for that business. And then I learned to write simple scripts to automate certain processes. And then it just got more and more and more complex. And that's how it came out of it. 
Uh, so what's my favorite thing about the industry? That it's open, that it's open, that it's not regulated by these uh, where you need to have uh, X certifications and diplomas to actually do the job. Um, that's why, in my opinion, the coding industry and technology has evolved so quickly is because we're not restrained by by uh, bureau bureaucracies uh, for the most part. So I'm not a big fan of bureaucratic uh, restraints. The market is the best way, in my opinion. And that's why coding moves so quickly, because you don't have to go through a bunch of red tape to get uh, new innovations put into place. All right. Uh, that's also a good thing that if you become a decent coder, you can pretty quickly find yourself uh, in an economically uh, free, financially free. Hey, Steph, quicker than I think just about any other profession. Actually, quicker than any other profession. Hey, Steph, I've been working with a not easy going boss. That sucks. I don't know. If in the project I did everything, the native mobile apps, the back end, the web apps, should I just quit this and start my own business? Oh, if you want to transition to your own business, you do exactly that. You transition. So you start exploring um, the business opportunities, whether freelance or SaaS, et cetera. And uh, you start exploring these things while you still have money coming in. So that when, and then you, I talk about that in my freelance course. If you look on YouTube, I've talked about that in several YouTube videos. Transition out so you don't have to worry about paying your bills, right? Work uh, a half an hour every night on it, you know, an hour or two on the weekends on this new business ideas, whatever it might be. And then, you know, because there's always this inertia period when you start a new business. There's this period where it could be a few months, it could be five months, six months before things start to to gel and things start to solidify. So the mistake is to cut yourself off of income and to jump into it because you can't push it through that much more quickly if you go full time, in my opinion, especially in the early uh, period when you're still learning. Colleen asks, will StudioWeb become an app? I don't think so, because it works pretty good as a responsive website. But you never know. No, you never know. When did you first start coding? About 256 years ago. Maybe a little sooner. I started coding. You know, I, I wrote my first code when I was like 14 years old, but it was not like pro coding. It was just, you know, doing simple animations and stuff with basic. But I really started coding in a serious way um in the early 90s in the early 90s so i don't know how old i was then i was in my 20s i guess mm. let's see what rob has to say i in on my first coding job i felt intimidated by other people's skills that's normal trust yourself and believe you're good too yep it's good if you find yourself in an environment with better coders that's amazing because you can learn from them right you can speed up the development process when i was learning how to fight I didn't go in there and train with a bunch of six-year-old, uh, you know, six-year-olds, you know, who I can beat up pretty easily. No, I went in against. I went to gyms with pro fighters and amateur fighters, people who actually knew how to fight, and that's how you're going to learn. You you want to surround yourself with talent, people who are better than you. That's how you learn. Uh, how to avoid perfectionism? I am very slow and often stuck on a in a piece of code just because it's not 100% happy with it. Yeah, I know how you feel about that. I've been there with all kinds of different things. What I would suggest is um, you change your focus on getting the job done. Instead of being a perfectionist about um, the quality or the purity of your code, be a perfectionist in terms of how quickly you can get a working app out the door. The goal is not super clean code. The goal is to get the app out of the door. And the real process of coding is not super clean code and then you're done. It's like writing. Like I wrote a book, my web design book, and the process is you do the first iteration. You want to get from the first page to the last page as quickly as possible. So you have like a, the totality of, of the work. Same thing with app writing. And then what you do is you go back and you do something called refactoring. So it gives me a chance. Hold on. So... Here's my book. I wrote this book. This is for beginners. It's on web design. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. There you go. Here it is. This is my book. And then if you want to refactor, this is a book I recommend for anybody. This is the book, Once You Know Your Basics. This is a Java book, but it's on refactoring. It's the key book. This book will take you from a mid-level programmer, which my courses will do, 
and this will take you to advanced coder. It's called refactoring. I'll put the link in the middle. My focus is not working. Here we go. There you go. There you go. That's the book to get if you want to take your coding skills to the next level. Super quick. Uh, yeah, there you go. All right, so let's see how we're doing. 25 minutes. Okay, so I want to jump into, I'm just going to give you a quick um, look at security, personal security online, because I had an issue happen to me recently. So last week, I had somebody uh, SIM jack my phone. So what is SIM jacking? There, somebody gets enough information about you, and they go to a cell phone company, it's not your own, and says, hey, my name is Steph, and I want to switch my line from this company to you. And the way the laws are in Canada, and I think they are in the States, it's easily done. So what they do is they switch your line from your phone to their phone, and all of a sudden they got access to all your phone. They got your number. They got your text. So then what they try to do is they try to then... Uh, They'll send you an email, a fake email, saying, hey, you should log into your bank account because they want to get your user ID. And if they get your user ID and then they have your cell phone, then they call the bank, say, hey, I lost my password, and they use your cell and, and then your then your bank will send a uh, the password via uh, SMS, right? You see where I'm going with this, right? People have been hacked, lost their life savings. So fortunately for me, I'm a, I'm a nerd and I saw I saw what was going on. I was able to fix it. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of a couple of basic rules because this could be like a mini course, right? Number one, I would not use two-factor authentication, and I'll explain what that is in a second, using your cell phone number, using uh, text, using SMS, because you can have your phone, uh, not your phone, but your line uh, hijacked, and it's a, very, it's a growing problem, and it's not, it's not difficult for them to do. Now, the way you can stop them from doing it, at least it helps, you have to call up your cell phone provider and you got to tell them, hey, you got to put a block, do not allow my line to transfer. Now, there's, I forget the terminology for it, but there's a particular term. So you have to call up your cell company, at least in Canada, and I think it's the same thing in the States, where you have to tell them, you are not allowed to switch my line and you have to go for much more, there's much more of a process uh, so it will take, take days to switch your line from provider A to B, but it helps slow down the SIM jacking. Another thing you should do, never put any cell phone, uh, never use uh, two-factor authentication with uh, your cell uh, SMS because if you get your line SIM jacked, that's a way they can get at your bank accounts, all kinds of other things. So when you're doing two-factor authentication, which I'll get into now, two-factor authentication, if you don't know, is you log in, that's the first factor. They should call it two-step authentication. So the first step is you log in, username and password. And the second step, what a lot of people use, is then you connect your cell phone, it could be to your Twitter, it could be to your PayPal account, it could be your bank. Then it sends a text to your phone, and then you got it with a code, you gotta enter that code to log in. But if somebody's hijacked your phone line, they get that code, then they can log into your bank account if they got your username, and then they can lock you out and steal all your money. It happens to people. So what you should do is not use two-factor authentication with the uh, cell number. There's much safer and better ways, which we're going to get into now. So uh, let me just jump into that. So I did the research. I think I might do a mini course and put this out uh, for free uh, once I have the time. So I don't know if you guys can read this or not. If it's clear enough, let me zoom in a bit. So this is a screenshot from uh, one of my accounts on Google. I, I blanked out all the crucial information, of course. But so there's a few levels of two-factor authentication that you can do. Now, I'll start from the most secure and I'll work my way down, okay? Now, not everybody provides all these methods, unfortunately, but they should. So let me just jump into it. So this is using Google. Google has the most advanced. So the first one is called a security key. Right, so I made this my default on Google. So what does the security mean? Key mean? I'll tell you what that is. So let me get uh, my view here. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, here we go. So I'll show you security key. So security key is that for somebody to log in to your account that has the security key, um, the security key is literally a physical thing. It could be like a USB type of thing. 
right? It could be your phone. Google Pixel phone now since April 10th supports this. It's got a special security chip on there and it becomes a security key. And what it does, I'm using the phone, it communicates through the Bluetooth with your computer. So what you do, is you have to set it up. The site has to support that. So I make my phone the security key. Nobody can log into my accounts unless they literally have my phone sitting beside the computer that I'm using the login with. So even if the hacker got my username and password, if they don't have the phone literally sitting beside the computer, communicating with the computer via Bluetooth, um, it's, they won't be able to get in. It's kind of like uh, the car key, the keyless entry. You know, you click a little button. It's kind of like that. Well, hold on. There you go. Like, so I got this car key, right? Well, hide my face. I got my car key, so I press the button, bing, and it gets me in my car, right? Uh, you can have, you can buy them online for like 40 bucks, 50 bucks on Amazon, where you have a, a basically a similar device. And when you log in the site, you press the button, it sends a signal to your computer, which sends a signal to the app. And okay, let the guy log in, let the woman log in. That is the best. This is what like uh, spies use and, and politicians use when they're traveling around the world. You can't log into the account unless the device is physically beside you communicating with the computer. That is the best security that there is out there today. The next level, we'll get into that now. Let me know, guys. Is this a subject you guys want to hear about? Yeah, okay. I don't know. You tell me. Okay, so let me just jump into the next level. Um, Google Prompt. Again, this is something to Google. Again, this is a... Uh, it sends a, a... Without getting into all kinds of details, this is a second level. It's, it sends a... a uh, a, a, a signal to your phone and you have to click it before you can log in. Now the next level, we scroll down, there's, uh, well, it's not, it's actually, yeah, you got something here called Authenticator Apps. Now there's an app you can install on your phone, works on all, you know, Android and, and, and iOS. And again, all the, all the big services provided, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, all of them, they all use Authenticator Apps where you install this app, you you, you set it up on the site. I'm not going to go into detail here, but it's, 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 and then you, it sends you a code and then you have to enter that code to log in. Now, how is that different from SMS? Because the authenticator app, uh, the Google prompt, uh, the security key for sure, this is bound to your piece of hardware. Whereas if you use uh, text or voice, that is bound to your account, your SIM account, which can be transferred to another piece of hardware. So you're much better off using the other methods. Um, of course, you should have a long ass password, right? You know, with all kinds of weird characters, you know, super log, right? And unique password for every login, right? And of course, you should have an unusual login name. So there you are, there you go. That's my quick, Quick and brief uh, lesson for you guys on uh, security. Uh, first thing you do is you make sure you have your cell, you call up the cell company, you tell them to block the transfer of your line. That's the first thing, you know, but that doesn't protect you. Next thing you do is at least use, uh, um, excuse me, authenticator apps to log into sites. I, you know, I do every, every social media site, everything. And whatever you do, do not bind, in my opinion, I would not bind a cell phone number with your bank account. Don't even do that because that's how they can hack people. So don't do that. So the good banks, the good banks were going to have, uh, they're going to have uh, physical keys. So you can't log into your bank account unless this key is sitting beside you. Anyway, there we go. I'll stop there. That's a good question. That's a good question. I'm not sure to you. In all honesty, I'm not sure how they work offline, but they do work offline somehow. I have to look into it. I just really became well versed in this recently because of my situation. Fortunately, because again, I was I'm a nerd. You never click. You know, I, I never click on email sent to me. Hey, you should click on this to log in. I never do. Never do. Never do. Even if it looks legitimate. Always go to another browser, and uh, just go to another browser and then log in there. That's how you're much, much safer. 
How do you track all your passwords? I actually track them on uh, paper uh, and I put them in a drawer somewhere. But what you could also do is um, there are there are password management apps that are very good. I was talking to my bro, who is a um, a major nerd too, programming as long as me. Uh, yeah, he uses something called One Password. He says it's very good. I've never used it, but that's something you may want to use. But I just track them on uh, sheets of paper. And of course, I'm using the key access now. Uh, and I'm using Authenticator apps, so it makes my life a lot easier. So, yeah, I'm telling you, first thing you do is don't bind your cell phone number to any critical things like your bank account. Heaven, that's the weakest link. That's the weakest link. And I've been told, uh, I've been told by friends who know people who work at some major banks here, but they know that. They know that. So they're, they're, they're moving to physical keys. That's the best, especially people who don't know anything about, like older people who are not comfortable with technology. Um, they, uh, they're the ones they sh you know, they should, they should make it law. If I was like the, the prime minister of Canada or president, I would say by law, the banks within a year have to implement it, a physical key technology just to protect everybody. Cause you know, you don't want to have to always be worried about these things because some people have been cleared, cleared out of their bank accounts for, through this type of online fraud. And a lot of banks, they don't, they don't protect you. They, you lost all your money. I saw this video of this guy. He lost his life savings. Poor guy. So there are some banks that may guarantee your money, but you better check into that. All right, so there you go. That's my little segment into, uh, yeah, yeah. Dashline is an excellent password manager. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So a super long passwords, guys. Don't share your passwords unique username and passwords across every single site and use uh, authenticator apps. Do not use SMS. And if you can use physical keys, those are, those are the best. Those are the best, the physical keys. Now they can't log in unless they have my physical keys sitting right beside them. Right? So there you go. So, uh, yeah, let's see what we got here. Stefan does, Sign in with phone, add layer of security, or is it just another way to sign in? I would not sign. I think I would argue. I used to think that sign in with phone was an extra level of security. I now think it's the opposite because the phone companies were not designing their systems to be uh, the single uh, security uh, mechanism. So, for instance, like it happened to be, they can just transfer your line to some other phone. And one day, you, is what happened to me, I was like, it was at six o'clock at night, so perfect time to do it. My phone, I lost my connection. I was like, no more connection. I was like, what's going on? At that point, they had transferred my line from my phone, my SIM, to their SIM. So they had full access to everything. So I had to investigate all this and call up. And, and, and the, um, what you call it? And the phone companies are not quick. They're not quick. I, I got a hold of them. I got a hold of the phone company. And they say, hey, and they said, oh, yeah, your line was hijacked. I said, well, stop it. He said, well, it's going to take us uh, yeah, maybe 24 hours. 24 hours. He said, yeah, they can't press a button. They have to fill out paperwork, if you can imagine that. They knew that, oh, yeah, I was hijacked. And it still is going to take them 24 hours before they can do anything. So thank God I had other things in place. But um, uh, they, they can't just shut it off. They just can't shut it off. So whatever you do, don't associate your cell number with any critical online things, could, because you're just that's the, that's the weakest link. The cell phone line is the weakest link. If you're going to do a login with your cell phone, use an authenticator app, without a doubt. Do not use SMS. Do not, in my opinion, the SMS you're opening yourself wide open. You're better to have a super strong password and a weird username than to have an SMS because it's just it's just a big security risk, in my opinion. So that's that's all. You do what you got to do. Good question. What happens when you lose your physical key? When you lose your, if you lose your physical key, that you, when you do set it up, you get this long ass password, secret password you get, you print it out, you put it in your drawer, and you have to go through this process with this long key to set up the whole thing again. That's how that works. Okay? So there is backups, right? I hadn't realized MSS, MS, SMS was so insecure, actually, by coincidence, but by coincidence, I have just moved to authenticator apps. So there you go. Yeah, do not use SMS, in my opinion. It's a major security hole. 
And I was talking to the, the specialist at the cell company up here in Canada, and they said the way it happened is it used to be hard to move the line from one provider to the next, but uh, by force of law, they were forced to make it easier because uh, other cell companies were complaining, hey, we can't move people easily. But it created this huge uh, um, security hole, right? And, um, and, just, and the guy was telling me in the last year, it's been exploding. This exploit has been exploding. So SMS, don't do it, in my opinion. I disagree with you. Well, you can. But uh, if you get your phone hijacked and you're using SMS, uh, good luck. You don't need to use MS SMS. All the major providers now use um, authenticator apps, use authenticator apps. This way, uh, the login is bound to the device and not to your line. So you're protected there. Some banks will prompt for GPS locations for logging and also for fingerprint. That's good. Biometric data, if it works, fantastic. Fingerprint, I think, is good. Um, there are banks up here. Again, they do the physical key, which I think is good. Uh, yeah, that's my advice. How much experience would you suggest getting in one language before moving on to another? It's, it's a question of need, right? If you were to learn, to me, if you learn one language, and you're working with it, and you're making money with it, and you're building real projects, then you can start exploring other things, you know? Uh, anyway, if you do the web stack, by uh, nature of the web stack, um, you'd be working with several languages. Yes, authenticator apps can also be compromised. There's no question. But according to Google and other sources, authenticator apps are much safer than SMS. Uh, that's why I say the key is the best you know i'm not a, a security expert this is just my recent um study and experience uh and talking to people reading articles google thinks authenticator apps are safer than sms they recommend them of course the physical key is by far the safest nothing is perfect but you have to have several layers right because they're going to nail you through either um, technological exploits and also social exploits right so you need a combination of the best. But if it's too complex, then there's mistakes that can be made, just like in code. If your code is too complex, you're opening yourself up, the, you're opening up the app, the opportunity for it to have more bugs and more problems. Google Authenticator uses Google account, which is backed by a phone number, and SimJacker can compromise you. Uh, it's not, you, can, you don't have to use the phone number and you don't have to use a SIM. You can use a ground line and then you can take it out. The best authenticator app would be the Google Authenticator. It's free and secure. I don't know if it is the best. I, I, I don't know, but I know it's uh, apparently pretty good. Um, but um, yeah, I don't have cell phone line connected to my Google app, so you know. Uh, another thing you can do, is some people do this, as you get an, a line under another name, somebody else's name, so it's not associated with you, I don't know, you're, uh, whatever. And you use that line to be your uh, the one associated with the account if you really feel you needed to do that. I would not say Google Authenticator is the best. Apparently, it's kind of bare bones compared to others. I just use it out because I want to get good. Google is not known for security. Well, perhaps. How would you know when to use backend frameworks or vanilla language? Size and scope. If it's anything beyond just a very simple one or two page thing, then you want to start getting into a framework for sure. Uh, I'm a security engineer, been in for like six plus years. Oh, there you go. So what do you have to say? Uh, yeah, but yeah, but you don't have to use um, the phone number. Like I remove my phone number off of Google, uh, or you could use a ground line. Yeah. So, but you may know more than me because I just just getting into all this. Yeah, they can be compromised, but you can say, but they're safer than SMS, right? Anyway, again, as I said, it's the key, the physical key that is the best. Yeah. Yeah, Google is a privacy nightmare. It is indeed. There's no question about that. Um, 
Is it safe to put all your data in the hand of a huge company? Think about it. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, I am a cybersecurity engineer and have been in the field for over 15 years, and I am a full stack developer as well. I do have some knowledge. All right, so what this, what, yeah, Google is now known for security. I want to see what they have to say. I'm not a security expert, I'm just getting into it. I was not saying, yeah, there are better, more complex solutions. I don't know if Google Authenticator has been proven to be, um, more easily hackable than other options. Not from my reading, but I'm not an expert in the field. Anyway, you understand the basic premise, right, of what you have to do here. Uh, there you go. I don't use a phone number. There you go. So uh, where we go. What your advice? Do I learn Laravel in 2020? If you have a demand, if you're going into PHP, Laravel is the key. Uh, How's isolation? No more Instagram lives? No, it's just a question of timing. Right, right now, I'm preparing for my move. Like, I just gave away a whole bunch of chairs. Well, a whole bunch of chairs. I gave away six chairs today. I gave away uh, air purifier, uh, all kinds of things. So I'm, I'm giving away, light, going minimal. And so, because I'm taking possession in about two weeks now. And uh, so, yeah. That's taking up a lot of my time, so you'll see that my lives will be a little less frequent. Oh, my God, already 46 minutes. All right, guys, I was only supposed to do a half an hour, but this is usual for me. So I hope you enjoyed this unusual episode. I'm not a, uh, a major security expert, so uh, research it, but I'm telling you, you want to, the first thing I would suggest is call up your cell company and, and put a block on there so they can't move the line so easily. That would be the first thing I would do. And uh, make sure that's basic. Make sure you have different passwords on every site, radically different passwords. Use password generators. Number two. Number three, I would look at the situation where you can use a physical key to secure your uh, access to any sites that you happen to use. Okay. From beyond that, uh, you have to talk to uh, UB keys. Yeah, exactly. I was looking at UB keys, but uh, I, might, I might use them for some other sites. So that might be one to go. People use open source projects, don't use tech giant projects. I I understand that, but I'm worried about open source because it's open source, so they know the source, so it's more easily hackable, right? Uh, but you could be right about that. Again, when it comes to security, uh, it's, it's not my forte, that's for sure. Uh, could you recommend a platform for young programmers to connect? Are you talking, Samu, are you talking about... Um, you mean social connection? You mean like uh, conversations and stuff? I don't know. Let me know. If people have a comment on that, let me know. Thanks for your time. No, no problem. Okay, okay. I'll answer a few more questions. I'm out of here. How do you make web apps secure to improve payment gateway security? Well, of course, it's built on that. You know, SSL, of course. Uh, you scrub all your SQL statements. Uh, and go on and on, have locked down servers. If I were you, if I'm a developer, especially if you're not working for a large corporation, I would be using a, um, a, a VPS that is uh, serviced and supported. So that's what I do. I have a company, that's all they do. They maintain the servers, they update all, the, they do all the patches, they make sure the security is there, they do the backups, they do the restores, they do everything. They take care of all the security. So I don't have the total control I used to have when I managed my own servers. But, you know, given the security requirements of today, you need somebody who's a specialist. You need a team of specialists managing servers. So I would go with a, um, a supported VPS solution so you don't have to worry about all that stuff. You can just worry about your app and your business. I hope that makes sense. How do you keep motivation in these stormy days? Well, I enjoy what I do. Um, and uh, I just mix it up. I mix it up. You know, when I go for my little coffee runs, that's the one way that I do that. Um, uh, I have a YouTube channel. Can you give me a push? S send me an email. I'll check out your YouTube channel. And I'll let you know if I want to do that. 
Uh, yeah. Is it bad to use no SQL for relational data? Well, you can have data with relations, as far as I know, with no SQL. But if you're gonna, if you have complex relationships to maintain in your data structure, then I go SQL. If you have lots and lots of data that has to be stored and uh, quickly retrieved, and the data, uh, the relationships in the data are slim to none, then you might go SQL. Yes, I asked about a platform to, be to become business or program partners. I asked because I'm looking for a partner for my projects. All right. Um, hmm, that's interesting. I wouldn't know where to go with that. Yeah, there can never be 100% security. I agree 100% with that. I agree 100% with that. Uh, do you love what do you do? You love, excuse me, do what you love or love what you do? That's a brain teaser for me. You got to enjoy what you do on a daily basis. You got, you got to get up and say, I have fun. Like today I was feeling pretty tired. I didn't feel like coming on. I said, you know what? I'll do the live stream because I enjoy the live streams. All right, guys, it's 50 minutes. I'm going to let you go. So uh, we shall talk soon. Do I put a video on here? Uh, yeah, I'll put the live stream clock in and then uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you.